Ladies and gentlemen, everyone around and in between, this is Debate Sensei CETA edition, where we talk about all things relevant to CETA debate, the Cross-Examination Debate Association. I have with me the director of debate at CSULB, Devin Cooper. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> All right. I'm uh, Jerry Kubica Miller. I am a professor of communications at Santiago Canyon College. I was a debater and I'm a debate coach. So uh, I'm just interested in sort of documenting the different uh, cultures uh, and approaches to debate of these different associations. So this one, I think we're OK. Last episode, we we're hyper focused on one small like not small, but like it was uh, it might be more nuanced. It's kind of like inside baseball, right? Like you got to be part of the community to know about the Louisville project. This is much different um, approach. It's more about how does CETA uh, like uh, uh, deal with things like cross-examination and prep time strategically? How does that compare to maybe some other associations? Uh, maybe there's something topical about like nuclear weapons that you know is is relevant, but that that's the sort of thrust for this one. Let's start with cross examination. So um, I was doing an episode with NFALD, and uh, they only get two cross examination periods, right? It's after each of those speeches, whereas CETA gets four of them. Um, uh, is there a strategy that kind of differs between those cross examinations, or do you just like let debaters do their thing? Um, I feel like it's a little bit of both. Okay. Um, I think that one of the major things, it also depends on the style of debate and what you're doing. Because if you're going to do like more straight up traditional policy debate, you're trying to poke holes inside of the affirmative to find links to your yeah. disads or trying to find violations for topicality. So you kind of ask them questions along the lines of those things because cross-examination in itself is really supposed to be something that is very strategic. Um, a lot of times people will ask clarifying questions, but mm -hmm. the main strategy going into cross-examination is that you should probably know the answer to your own question already. Okay. That's the main thing. Because if you know the answer to the question and where you want the other team to arrive at, that's when you're able to strategically weaponize their answer against them. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I come from a type of debate that we didn't have any cross-examination. They were just points mm -hmm. of information. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but you just stand up and then your opponent chooses yeah. whether or not they recognize you. Um, and so we had like, you know, we had to be like really concise and you had to, and you only got one shot at it. But the, when I was able to do some uh, cross examination for the first time, I absolutely loved it because you're able to do like follow up questions. And it's, it, it in my experience, it's like, it's the follow up questions that get people more than like the initial question. Uh, what are your thoughts? Like, do you, is there a way to train people to do that? Because I tell my students, I'm like, okay, ask follow-up questions, but I don't have better, more clear advice than that. You know what I mean? I can't really direct them well. I don't know why. Well, I mean, well, you should be going into cross-examination with a strategy based on a particular team. And like I yeah. said earlier, the style of argument. Um, and so like when you're thinking about follow-up questions, these are questions you want to ask about evidence mm -hmm. and you want to ask questions about solvency mechanisms and like how does the affirmative reach that and how does the plan adequately do that or if you have some type of advocacy statement how does your advocacy achieve this amelioration of the structural impact that you talk about mm -hmm. or what is the stance against that or what do you do to change the material reality of that existing through your advocacy so a lot of the questions and policy debate will definitely focus on the evidence and what evidence you've read and how are you abiding by what the evidence says because you're like you know in cards there's like fine print that people like make right. really small font oftentimes what i tell my students is like blow that up and look at that and what is in that fine print because right that's where there's a lot of inconsistencies with the things that they're arguing or there is larger doubt that's being cast on the author about the efficacy or the outcome of that 
argument that they're making. Man, I've even seen cards cut that they they re reduce the font for like qualifiers on words. You know, be like, I'm like you're you're gonna you're gonna yeah. get the qualifier in the set. Yeah, okay. like things that might be like maybe or yeah. possibly or right? often. Yeah, you know, it's like mm -hmm. what in the world? Okay, so uh, cross examination is like you get to look at it directly. But you're talking about policy debate. Those are some typical questions. Do you think that there's some pretty typical formulaic questions for critical debates? Well, yeah, like, I mean, well, some of the main questions that people are asking in critical debates is like, why vote F? Okay. Like, that's kind of like the main broader question, which I don't think is always the most effective question. No. Because no. it allows for that team to just rattle off a bunch of just random stuff, right? But the major question that you ask in like critical debates is that, hey, you've pointed to this impact and you pointed to like racial capitalism or white supremacy or anti-blackness. What exactly does your advocacy do to ameliorate material conditions of people being affected by that? Or are you just an insular form of politics that's talking about debate? Or are you talking about spill out? Like, what is it the mechanism that you're really trying to embrace when you're talking about these impacts and your affirmative? Right, because oftentimes people are just like, no, I just want to talk about debate. I just want to talk about the stuff that happens here. Some people are like, no, I think we need to have an organizing movement that like galvanizes educational perspectives in this space in order to spill out in that way when we become people that are in power, stuff like that. I mean, some of the, the best questions are like the, the simplest ones. Uh, in, in my other episode, something like simple is like, so how do you define blackness? <laughs> like, oh, man, I don't know. Like I, I, I would want to be prepared for that question because it just gets yeah. Man, yeah. But see, this is the thing when you're asking a critical team that oftentimes if they're talking about like black based arguments, right? They oftentimes will like problematize the question and so oh. yeah, and they'll just they won't give you a real static definition. They'll be like, you know, beating around a bush. You'd be like, well, I think that's just really like kind of like weird for you to ask that question because blackness takes on like a lot of the ontological epistemological like understandings and blah, blah blah you know it becomes like really watery so no one really gives you a direct answer to a lot of those questions because oftentimes what they know is that if you give like this kind of static answer about what blackness is then you're able to nail them into like a particular interpretation because cross-sex and policy is binding oh you know? okay yeah, so um, if you give me an answer, and I'm going to probably use that answer against you later. Oh, right. Gotcha, gotcha. Which is what I, I coach my students to do that, that they need to get answers and don't let the other team know that it's the answer that you wanted them to say. Just mm. like kind of act like a little bit confused about what they said and kind of ask follow-up questions and keep getting them to dig the hole deeper. Yeah. And that's the thing. Because when the moment that you get excited about a cross-examination question, then they're like, well, that's not fully what I meant. This is my, <laughs> you know, my yeah. Thing, so okay, okay. Um, so a couple of strategies I go over with my students, and they're like on the opposite ends. I wanted to know if uh, which ones you prefer, or or when, or how often. It's it's answering, giving really short answers versus giving really long answers, like on the strategic ones. So if like they're answering yes or no questions, answer with the yes or no. Um, I, I was even talking with, you know, in, in the other episode, in answering, like, how do you define blackness? You're like, yeah, we didn't take a position on that in the affirmative. It, it's like, <laughs> uh, if, if this is a team that reads black arguments, you never want to say that. Never say that, huh? No. Okay. So, Not like, wrong. that that's an interesting sort of crossover right there, because that's, you know, they're like, oh, this is one this is what i might say well, so i think that when people say we didn't take a stance on that that allows for people to create arguments that then say civil society is constructed through x oppression and because mm -hmm. you did not take a stance on it you do not have the means in which to tackle the formations and material consequences of what comes from that theory of power mm. so that's why it's really bad to say we don't take a stance on that Right, but the thing also is that what matters is the judge. And right. that becomes the issue. Because mm -hmm. if it's a judge that probably would answer that question in the same way, then that could fly. But if it's a judge is thinking more critically about how those things interact, 
with the affirmative or negative position that you're talking about, then it becomes a little bit more murky. But mm -hmm. sometimes students know what judge should be able to pull that shit with. So okay. When cross examinations are happening in CETA, are there still like roles being played? Is there like is the one in the 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 one in C are are they asking questions or are they just prepping? Well, so if you are asking questions to the affirmative, the two and the person who typically is the two in C will be asking questions right. to that one in C. Yeah. And so that one in C should be prepping because you like usually in policy debate, you don't take prep for the one in C. Okay, you don't like right, right, right. You you no. like ready to go. I mean, there's prep time and then there's prep time. Like prep time starts when like when you know who your opponent is, when you know what mm -hmm. your side and what your opponent is, right? So yeah. um during that prep time, you're you're getting that that's basically what you're using. Um, I mean, that could be like 30 minutes, 45 minutes right there. Uh, yeah, we get like uh, average is like 30 minutes. Okay. And so yeah, as Sometimes soon as that happens, hour. yeah, on well, set. Sometimes it's an hour. Some, if they, yeah, if they're running behind something. something well, I'm saying that. like built into the tournament, like like, oh, like built in. MBT and CETA usually is sometimes like 45 to an hour. Okay. Okay. Um, what's that like? Because in NPDA, our prep time before the round is like, you know, a specific set time. It's like, all right, prep time starts now. Um, and then it's just this frantic you know, room, people are writing on the whiteboard, you know, everyone is barking arguments. I'm assuming that a lot of the preparation came before the tournament. So, yeah, yeah, that's, that's literally what it is. A lot of preparation came before the tournament unless somebody says uh, new F. They new say F. new F. That means that they're not telling you anything about it. OK, that, I, I did want to get into that one, too, because that's exactly the same thing as NFALD. New mm -hmm. F. All right. So new F, it's it's customary it's accepted that you you don't share any details if you're breaking a new app and that's totally fine everyone's cool yeah but everyone is not cool if it's a particular <laughs> style of debate so usually oh. when it's critical debaters they will make an argument about disclosure but not in a very traditional sense more so like tactics or revolutionary test or <laughs> you know, you shouldn't not disclose to people of color or X person, right? For whatever reason. And that would be an argument. That doesn't mean that that's going to be the argument that's going to be in the two and R, but it becomes an argument because it's, it's seen as like kind of disrespectful and that you're like hiding. Okay. You know, when you read a new app and you're okay. not willing to talk about anything about it. Because now, there's some, there's some elements where people will say, oh, I'll tell you that it's, it's, it's T, oh. right? Or if it's like a critical F, or it's like talking about a particular area of the topic, right? Okay. So like this resolution, they'll be like, yeah, it's going to be disarmed, but it's going to be a different iteration of how we discuss it. Oh, oh okay, okay, okay. But sometimes people just like, no, new F. New no F, problem. that's it. Okay. So when new F comes along and you have cross X, is it, do you typically take some prep at that time? Is that... Sometimes people take prep before cross-examination, yes, to make oh. sure that they got in line what they're going to oh. say, right? But that prep is usually like something really quick and you're just like, hey, we're going to ask about this, this, and this, and this, and this. I just read this in the evidence, blah, 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 right? Because usually oh, if gotcha. there's a team that gives you their case and all that good stuff beforehand, what happens is that you're able to look through their evidence. But when they're reading a new app, you only have the time to like look through as they're reading it and try mm. to look through all that stuff. And so that becomes a time where you might take a little bit of prep before cross X to figure out your cross X strategy. So before cross X, huh? like not necessarily before the one and C. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Because right. if you ask the particular questions in cross examination, what happens is that the person who is preparing the one and C is getting all the elements ready based on what those answers are. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because you're fishing for links at that point. Right. How much prep time is there again? In is it eight? Ten. Ten. Ten minutes. Right debate. Yes. Ten. Yeah. Okay. However. All right. <clears throat> there have been some new funky things that people have been trying to do here with cross examination. I can't really fully explain them, but I just told my students not to engage them things. Uh, there's been like flat 
Marx kind of usage or alternative use of time, right? Where you could take some prep time for cross X or some cross X time for okay. prep. They did an experiment with this at a couple of tournaments this year, and it was just like, oh my God. So, so it's, it's an actual sort of rules proposal, like change? Well, it's like a, an experiment. Right, right, right. Experiments but, have been doing. Yes, you can engage it or you just don't. Right. And I told my students just don't engage it because it's confusing. Wait, um, so there like was, individual teams are going, hey, do you want to try flex time or? No, like the, the tournament. tournament. Oh, the is, tournament is. OK. Yeah, like Harvard at their tournament, they did some of this funky flex stuff where you could ask the one in our questions. Yeah. I mean, oh, it was, it was, cute, I see. It was a cute I experience. See. Right. But like I told my students, we're going with the regular stuff. We don't got time to be mixing with all that. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And, NPDA went that route. So NPDA, like I said, used to only have points of information. You had to actually ask a question during the speech and yeah. not even the first or last minute and only during constructives, not during rebuttals. Now they've switched over to this flex time thing where it's oh. like a, a mixture between cross X and prep time. I think they, I, I forget how much they get. Um, and, but they're only allowed to, it, it, they do it four times total. Mm -hmm. as well but i think they do one flex time after the one ar here like you said so it's not even during the block yeah that's what it is that's yeah, what I, don't it is. I don't have time for that it's too much. okay it's wow too i much. like that's surprising i wonder where that where that concept even came from like because right, listen i don't know i mean i think it's good for people who like it but let's not go about making it a real like thing mm -hmm. okay so yeah um so I'm like the the idea of prep time to me is like other than before the round is completely foreign to me. All right, um, how do you how do you coach students like like to use their prep time more effectively? What are tactics that you would expect to like you pass on to some students of yours? Well, so we oftentimes if we're negative, we're using prep time to look for links in their evidence or things that could be picked out of. You know, with a counter, like you know, you know, just pick out of the a word they might say, okay. right? Or something in the plan we might pick out of it. Um, we're looking for particular words when it comes to that, and now we want to <laughs> disclose all that because it's a strategy. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but <laughs> we're looking for words and people's evidence. Uh, we yeah. also are looking for links. We're also looking for doubts that their author has about the overarching argument that they're making. Mm. Uh, we're also looking at the qualifications of the author as well. Okay. And okay. Who they work for and who pays them. So ma mainly, it's it's just you're sitting there scanning, like yeah, and, and looking for and you got. And we're saying okay, so <laughs> we have this argument, and we're going to use that argument with this mm -hmm. because this is like a thing that links to that. Um, and so a lot of it is thinking about what is our stock arguments that we usually have and how can we force a link into that um, or thinking about other strategies we haven't done yet or strategy haven't done in a while if they link to that uh, argument that they're making. It would, and seem kind of, people do. it would seem kind of difficult to be. So if if I'm, I'm setting up to to give the one NC. And I'm scanning, scanning, scanning while cross X is happening. I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I could do those two things at the same time. I have trouble reading. Well, I got a partner. Yeah, yeah. But the so the partner, right? But the like so before I get up and talk, does the partner say, "All right, they said this, this, and that"? They can. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Is that common? I, is all I'm saying. Oftentimes, yeah. Sometimes yeah. you say something quick, really fast, you know, or just like if you have like a system worked out. A lot of teams have systems work out to make the time more efficient. I mean, more efficient. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, so I think that we should just call this a nice short episode on some, some basic general concepts uh, as well. All right. So, uh, Devin, thank you so much for giving me the insights, especially on the subtle differences between like a f uh, four people debating versus two people debating. I, I, uh, I did do CETA a couple of times. And sometimes I, I was just running out of steam on those cross X. I'm like, I know what I'm going for. I don't really need, like, mm -hmm. do you just, do you just. I mean, sometimes you can waive cross X if you want. Oh, yeah. But I mean, then that, that cuts your, that cuts your prep time now. It also cuts their prep time too. Oh, uh, that's true. That's true. 
Because they're prepping the same time you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Because sometimes people can be a little bit more clairvoyant about the questions that you're asking. Because you can tell. Yeah. Like especially if it's a traditional team asking arguments about the topic to a critical team. We oh, already, yeah. <laughs> we already know that you're going to go for T. Uh, <laughs> or you gotta read that in the one and see, yeah. or you're trying to get a link to deterrence. <clears throat> yeah, did that. That's just what it is. Like, there's a lot of things that signal if you're really smart and you're thinking about what people are asking you. They're mm -hmm. fishing for a link. Yeah, that's just what it is. I uh, I don't know if you're a chess fan, but well, chess was one of my influences on on how to perceive this. And uh, sometimes I use that metaphor where. You're making a move in chess you're not you don't make the move hoping that your opponent doesn't know what you're doing right mm -hmm. like you always make a move like you hope that they know full well how screwed they are you know what I mean? it's like you, you just because it's a good move you know what i mean it's like and so like, like that transfers over to asking questions is some people are so hesitant to ask the really straightforward questions because they think that oh, they'll see this coming or they know what's going to happen. But that's exactly why you should ask it because uh, it forces them to commit to something. You know what I mean? It's like mm -hmm. they don't want to commit until you make but, them commit. But so that's the thing these days. You have to kind of be a little bit more sneaky mm. because now people are like, these this new generation of debaters are like that's a stupid question. Like I don't want, why is that relevant? Why is that question even relevant? Right? They'll say that. Yeah, they will, and it's just like yo, just answer the question. Like I don't, <laughs> I don't understand, right? But oftentimes when people are engaging in that kind of answer, that tells you that they don't know the answer to it, or they're scared of revealing a particular weakness. Mm. That's just what it is. So and you I think tell my students, I tell my students all the time, like if people give you answers like that. You need to use that in your speech to be like, we asked them, this is a cross sex. They were reluctant to answer, didn't answer at all. Here's why. Yeah. And then, you know, make right. that up. Right. Because you like, you know what their answer is, should be. You know mm -hmm. what the answer should be. And if, they, if they're dancing around it, you're kind of like, that's not going to save you. Right. And, I, and what I will say is that one of my debaters, um, Diego, he is excellent at cross examination. Exactly. I would, yeah, I would I would pay to get a lecture from him and cross examination oh, yeah. with somebody else because he like sets up his questions really well and he's really like calm about it, really like like hey, I'm just trying to give you you know ask you these questions blah blah blah, and then you see like in his speech like later in the two and C, he's bringing some stuff up from the cross examination from earlier saying this is why this was important blah blah blah, and it was like oh my god he set you up, <laughs> right. That's yeah that's awesome that's awesome i would love to get yeah like maybe uh uh an interview with him on this particular series that'd be great um we'll see how y'all do at uh, regardless of how y'all do uh for the remainder of the semester but that 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 would be great okay uh -huh. all right well thank you for your insights um we will be back talking more about CETA stuff in the future all right all right. All right.